As the healthcare industry moves closer to full-scale implementation of health information exchanges and integrated delivery networks, the call for data integrity and interoperability standards has grown increasingly louder to help ensure that data quality isn't compromised so physicians and patients have complete confidence in the information reflected by their electronic health records. The proliferation of healthcare electronic health records and the transition of data across health information exchanges opens the door to data corruption, and as these systems become larger and more complex, vulnerabilities will grow. In most other industries, data integrity is just as important, but corruption errors can often be rectified and mistakes fixed. In healthcare, it often becomes a matter of life or death. One of the primary concerns with maintaining data integrity is implementing a consistent approach across the health information exchange to matching patients with their data. Both physicians and patients have to trust and rely that data is complete, current, accurate, and secure. Escalating the complexity of health information exchanges as more networks are added and more data is fed into the system will only necessitate a concentrated effort by the entire industry to produce common standards that foster confidence data stays intact. The ultimate solution to maintaining end-to-end -end data integrity doesn't originate from one company, but must be a collective and cost-effective effort from all healthcare providers across the industry. We recently spoke with John Donnelly, President of Interpro Solutions in Colonia, New Jersey, and an expert in healthcare technology standards, interoperability, and innovation about data integrity and data standardization protocols in the context of the shift to electronic medical records and the subsequent data sharing across health information exchanges. The following podcast is a recording of our conversation. Hi, this is John Trader with m 2 Sys Technology. Uh, today we are uh, really happy to have John Donnelly, uh, who is the president of uh, Interpro Solutions out of Colonia, uh, New Jersey. And John is here today to talk to us about uh, data interoperability in healthcare and some other issues. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, for over 35 years, uh, John has been instrumental in the development and implementation of information technology solutions in a variety of industries. In 1994, uh, John established an independent consulting business focused on the development and publication of health IT interoperability standards and the adoption of these standards by all levels of care provider entities and health information organizations in support of achieving the new interoperable quality-based delivery paradigm. Um, commencing in 2010, uh, John serves also as HIMSS, which is the Healthcare Information Systems Society uh, strategic advisor on the topic of healthcare interoperability throughout the world and the effective testing and demonstration thereof in national and international venues. Uh, to promote innovation in the uh, HIT solutions within the industry, John also serves as the operations director of the New Jersey Healthcare Innovation Center, which is a collaboration of the state's information technology university and its largest care delivery network. Uh, John has also been a speaker on the subjects of healthcare technology standards, interoperability, and innovation at annual and regional healthcare conferences, and also an author in publications sponsored by the Healthcare Information Systems Society, better known as HIMSS, uh, the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, and also the Medical Record Institute, as well as at conferences sponsored by medical colleges and associations for specific clinical disciplines. John serves on the board of IHE International, a leading standards development organization promoting health information exchange worldwide and is a lead on a number of initiatives sponsored by the HHS Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, known as ONC. John has also been involved in a lot of different projects and initiatives uh, that surround standards and interoperability for healthcare data and has a lot of experience um, in this field. So we're very, very honored to have John with us today to talk about this topic. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you, John, uh, and thank you for, for that introduction. Uh, it's interesting to hear some of the things that I've been involved in over the years. <laughs> um, 
I just uh, wanted to ask you, uh, just out of curiosity, uh, how did you land in healthcare? Um, I know uh, based on your bio that you have experience in some other industries. Um, what, what is your passion uh, for healthcare, specifically uh, interoperability issues and how they relate to health IT? Well, the, the roots of that decision actually come from the company I was working with at the time. It, it was uh, Siemens, and, and those that know the company, the, the, uh, the, the German company, uh, is basically in anything that makes electronics and electricity or uses electronics and electricity. Um, and uh, had to make a decision along the career line to just pick an industry that, that they were in. And the interesting thing is that I was coming at it from the IT side, and um, as I saw the developments of medical devices in the IT space, uh, or in the med I'm sorry, the medical device space, uh, it became more and more apparent that there was going to be a merger of device information sourcing as well as electronic systems and replacement of paper records and and uh, the computer and medicine just got joined at the hip. This was back in the, in the mid-80s. And uh, with that, uh, it became kind of an immediate, uh, you, you know, a transition for me and, and, and a uh, uh, passion to take that to its utmost and try to figure out how do we get technology to be leveraged uh, as much as possible in the industry. Great. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, what we've uh, done is we've developed a list of questions for John, and they are surrounded uh, on the topic of data interoperability in healthcare. Um, as as uh, most of our listeners know, uh, recently we've seen uh, the federal government providing healthcare with initiatives to move towards more of an electronic uh, medical record format, and some of those uh, have have been uh, very instrumental in uh, pushing these these healthcare providers uh, towards more of an electronic uh, uh, data storage model. And with the move towards electronic medical records, of course, there's a lot of issues that come up uh, with data interoperability and data integrity. And uh, John, being an expert, we, we'd like to just kind of explore this topic a little bit uh, more in depth with him and ask him some specific questions about his opinions and his insight on uh, where we, where is healthcare heading uh, in terms of, of data interoperability and uh, data integrity in the new healthcare electronic medical record paradigm. Uh, we're going to start off, uh, uh, John, by asking you what major challenges do hospitals and healthcare providers face as they begin to share patient data across health information exchanges and integrated delivery networks? Yeah, John, I, I think the best answer for this is, is to kind of split the thought into two avenues. I mean, if we look at it from a technical perspective or a technology perspective, some of the things that come to the surface right away are, are one is patient identification. Um, it's not something that entities generally had to worry about outside their four walls or their enterprise. Uh, now it becomes a big topic, and uh, we'll speak more to that, I think, as, as we talk more, but it became something that was a nonchalant thing of registration to something that, that now has implications. Um, uh, some other things in the technology area is the idea that you, you may have to deal with data that you didn't source. So so how do you identify that, and, and how is that segment? in your medical record systems. Um, and, and last but not least is the fact that, you know, data looking at our, our devices that we have, our smartphones, our tablets, etc., uh, it's starting to become much more mobile, more portable. Uh, so how do you deal with that from a, from a security standpoint but also an information exchange? You know, the other side is uh, kind of from the business side. And there, if you look at the medical professionals in the industry, you know, they have to deal with a new kind of patient record data ownership uh, situation. You know, who does own this record if it's now been sourced by multiple people? It's, it was very easy when it was in their cabinet. Now it's a little different. Uh, they have to look at, you know, maybe their way of treatment. You know, they have to... Uh, possibly, uh, you know, consider a kind of a team medicine idea, you know, especially in primary care where they may have to have some uh, patient treatment coordination activities and workflows that they didn't have to do. Um, and uh, and lastly there, I think what we'll see as we start to go more electronic is we'll see more data analytics, health data analytics being available and good health data analytics. Uh, we've had analytics in the past. 
I don't think they were grounded in in really good uh, metrics, um, good values, good numbers. Uh, I think that uh, going forward, as we start to get more electronic, uh, this is what's going to help the industry with some of its decision making. Okay. Uh, just having, uh, kind of moving on a little bit uh, with with the same uh, uh, idea in in terms of uh, health systems. Um, what, with the pressure to conform with health information exchange requirements, what changes have you seen health systems make to their strategic vision of quality health care? Uh, yeah, I think for starters, let's make sure we understand when we say health system, what, what we're talking about here. You know, for me, a health system covers all aspects of care delivery. So you have your hospital, you know, your acute care, uh, ambulatory, long-term care, post-acute care, emergency department, etc. So right there, you, you have quite a myriad of, of settings here that you need to deal with. Um, but uh, what we'll see is that initially, it was almost a knee-jerk reaction to meaningful use. Right, that, that came out, and everybody said, "Oh, Jesus, I got to do this." Nobody wants to leave money on the table, so you know we we, we have to make sure we do that. So that that all of a sudden bubbled to the surface. Um, but I think that uh, as they started to think through it, they realized it's just a stimulus. It's it's meant to uh, try to motivate the industry to think differently uh, and to change, you know, how they uh, capture their their information and share it. Uh, so that means, from an IT standpoint, they started to now look at uh, do a good assessment of their system partners. Who are their partners? What value where do they bring? So they start to reassess that. Um, I think that they started to also look at the professionals that are serving their organization and to identify and, and, and hone a good care team you know, for their specific patient populations. And, and so they started to uh, see, well, gee, you know, how do they ensure a bond between the care team members that they want and, and versus others maybe that they that they don't feel are important. Uh, and, and lastly, I think what we're going to see is that they as organizations need now to really look closely at what differentiates themselves from their peers. If, if we're in an information sharing paradigm, uh, ownership and seclusion of information is no longer the option to leverage. So now you have to say, well, what is? You know, what makes me better than the next guy? Where am I weak? Where am I strong? Okay, great. You you, you mentioned a couple of things in there. Uh, ownership, data ownership, I know is um, uh, is one of the problems I, I, I guess that arises from the. The, uh, the birth of health information exchanges. Um, let, me, let me ask you a question, though, about uh, data visibility. There's been a lot of talk about the fact that moving to an electronic uh, medical record format will allow many more patients to have access to their own medical records so that they can have more of a say in their health care, uh, more of an impact in the health care that's delivered to them. Um, just following along those lines um, of patient empowerment, uh, as well as on the provider side, releasing information that previously may, may have been difficult to access, and speaking specifically about electronic medical records, how, how do you feel that data visibility will change the patient-provider relationship? Well, I, I think we have to consider the, the patient now as a partner. Uh, I mean, so if we think of the provider's role changing from being less directive and more collaborative, um, then we're also going to see that the, uh, the kind of assumed patient commitment that they have, right? They, they assume that a patient is taking and following the medicines and the treatment that's been prescribed. It's going to become more explicit. Uh, I think uh, it, it's not only going to be a one-sided change that the provider is now going to see something or have to change on their side. I think that the patient now, is going to have to understand that uh, ownership of data or participation in data integrity uh, means they have to step up for that. They, it's their responsibility to help do that. Um, and I think that 
the, at the end of the day, it's the right direction. Um, it, it just means that uh, we're going to see a much more collaborative uh, dialogue there. Um, and I think we saw initially uh, there was kind of a reaction to uh, uh, health information being available on the web, and and patients all of a sudden showed up at the at the doctor's doorstep with uh, with printouts and said, you know, well, what can you tell me about this? And uh, you know, I think we went through that era a little bit, or maybe we're still towards the end of that. But now we're seeing much more provider-directed web guidance, uh, you know, so as opposed to opposing that information resource, the providers have said, hey, let's, how do we leverage this, but let's make sure that they're getting good information um, and uh, that we can be a, uh, you know, a good mentor, you know, to how do they do that. So I, I do think that, uh, that it is in the right direction, uh, but it is definitely a, a change in the relationship probably as one of the fundamental uh, uh, revisions to, to the environment. Great, thank you. Uh, you touched earlier, John, on patient identification. You mentioned that uh, previously uh, it may not have received much as much attention or uh, as much um, uh, uh, as as much of a focus uh, by healthcare providers as it does now. Uh, how how does patient identification affect data integrity and healthcare information exchange? Well, to, to use someone else's uh, uh, phraseology here, it's job one. Uh, I, it, it really has become critical to the process. Um, and, and what we are seeing as we start to stand up these electronic uh, environments is that processes that were very, uh, I would say, nonchalantly handling patient registration and identification are now becoming mission critical. They are now becoming something that is the, the fundamental building block uh, uh, for which all the data is now collected and organized and, and, and who has access to it and, and why do they have access to it. Um, and so we're seeing from a patient identification side what we might have considered as uh, uh, and also from the uh, the access rights of who can see things, we might see something that uh, was a simple set of demographics and with a simple password. Now we're going to see things where we're going to be uh, expecting uh, that there's a little bit more. Um, uh, involvement, what we might call a, a two-factor or three-factor, and in, in, to use the security jargon here, that that's, that raises the bar uh, of of insurance that the individual that we're talking about and the individual that is interacting with this information is indeed uh, that person. And and uh, you know, ultimately, when we when we talk three-factor, we're talking things like biometrics and you know, um, you know, scans and fingerprints and palm things and all this stuff that that's going on. And I think that that we're going to see things that are going to be a necessary component of registration processes. Uh, you know, one of the stories I hear all the time is when you take uh, any of these uh, hospital systems that are in the inner cities and, and, and in the, uh, the urban areas, uh, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, some names and demographics that show up repeatedly. And, and I think there's going to be a real challenge there to make sure that that identification uh, is right on the money. Uh, you know, what we see and what we read in some of the medical press is about this person personalized medicine idea, well, you certainly don't want to, to be doing a personalized medicine algorithm uh, when you really don't know that you're dealing with the same, that they're the same exact person. So, right. uh, You had uh, mentioned biometrics as, as uh, a, a newer te a patient identification technology uh, that's, uh, that's being used by uh, hospitals and, and healthcare facilities increasingly more and more. Um, are there any other patient identification technologies that you've seen in your travels or come across that you think also have promise outside of biometric patient identification? Um, I think the, the only ones that I have seen that have been used uh, is not even that far along. It, it's more, I think, is what is called the two-factor, where there's a token of some sort, where there's a, a validation of uh, of what somebody uh, has on their person. Um, so it's not quite moved to, to to the biometrics, and that's one that I think I've seen, uh, you know, be deployed as as a way. And uh, you know, I think we also see uh, some processes uh, changing. If you look at uh, the dispensing of medications uh, in an acute care setting. Uh, they, they now have quite a number of scans. They use the uh, 
uh, the band on on the patient. They they have a band on the dispenser. They have a band on the uh, 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 the provider that's that, that's uh, that's giving the med. And uh, you know, so so there is kind of a way to cross check uh, against uh, you know errors in terms of uh, you know inaccurate. Um, you know, dispensing of, of meds to, to the wrong individual. So these are some of the things. I, I think as we start to see this go more mobile, um, I think we're going to start seeing the leveraging of things that are happening on the smartphone. And, uh, you know, that, that could be uh, an easier path than even biometrics. Okay, great. Thank you for all those comments. Um, Let's talk for a minute a little bit more about health information exchanges and their effects on patients. Um, obviously, when you bring up the topic of a health information exchange, uh, sometimes it, um, it, it, it invokes certain feelings in patients that uh, their medical data is out there for everyone to see. Um, do you see the growing importance of these health information exchanges in healthcare having any effect on state regulations for patient privacy and security, which is increasingly becoming a, a hot topic around health information exchanges? Yeah, I think it already has. So it's, that's not a future. That, that, mm -hmm. That's a current um, and, and probably has been over the last couple of years. Um, I, I think for one thing, I know we we always tend to lump privacy and security together as as if uh, you know their solution is homogenous. Um, uh, they are they are quite different uh, to to resolve. I, I think from from a technological standpoint, and you know for me, security is the easier one. I mean that that's kind of can be resolved by some pretty good existing technology around standards and, you know, ensuring uh, encryption and, and a variety of things uh, of exchange that we can do. Uh, we, we, we do secure exchanges in other industries today. So so the, uh, I'm not too worried that we won't be able to do secure exchanges. Uh, so the security side, I think, is is, is resolvable. The, the privacy one is somewhat that's a little unique to healthcare. And on the privacy side, we we will definitely see uh, many, many dialogues around, uh, for starters, the benefits of an opt-in approach versus an opt-out approach. And, 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 and states uh, have been discussing this now pretty heavily for the last couple of years. And uh, uh, there are arguments on both sides. And, and, and one seems to be uh, coming from the uh, deployment side saying that opt-in is harder to deploy, but yet the opt-in enthusiasm you say, hey, you know, if we would just leverage that as a way for awareness of process and awareness of of the new program uh, to the patient, and 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 combine that with uh, with that dialogue, then you'll find that the very high percentage of the patients are going to opt in. So you're not really at risk. But we see it on both sides. Uh, opt out seems to be one that that says, hey, we can we can stand up something and get it going uh, without a lot of, uh, you know, upfront dialogue with the patients, which is really what we want because we want to have something to to demonstrate uh, so that if they ask questions, we can say, hey, this is an example of, of how we can do it. But I, I think we're definitely going to see legislation um, to try to address that the challenge uh, around that decision, um, and the uh, I see two things happening. One, we are going to have to think about state boundaries. We can't be uh, jeopardizing those patients that are living on the borders of, of states because one state's decided to go one path, another one another path. Mm -hmm. that, would, that would be totally insan total insanity. And, and second, we have to come up with a way that we can share a consent uh, and, pr and, and patient preference input across those boundaries or, or whatever regions that need to uh, that have providers that, that are serving that patient uh, and not have this be something that you know like we're seeing today in the paper world where every time you go into a doctor's office you have to fill out you know another set of demographics as if you know you never uh, were anywhere else on this planet so mm -hmm. so we have to do a little better job of, of the consent exchange and but uh, I, I think we can do it. It's just that it is going to take some some change, and some of some of it is going to need legislative change. Okay, I know you mentioned opt in and opt out uh, earlier in in the answer to that previous question. Um, I know that health information exchanges typically allow patients to opt 
out or are operating in opt-out states, uh, potentially lowering the quality of data. Um, what do you feel are the primary benefits that patients should be educated on about the importance of health information exchanges? Well, the, the, the ones that are the challenging ones are not the ones at the opt-out states. They're, they're, they're the opt-in states. So, and, and we have a little bit of both uh, because the opt-in states are saying, uh, you know, you can't exchange anything un until they've actually had that dialogue and, and you've got that consent. Um, I think that the main thing here is, one, to um, ensure that the patient is aware that this is happening. And I think this is one of the biggest arguments that the opt-in enthusiasts have. They say, look, we need to get the patient empowered. We need to get them engaged in this. Um, so we need to make sure that they understand that this is going on and, and what impact that might have on their ability to share or a, their provider's ability to share uh, their medical information with another provider in their interest. Um, and uh, and even though HIPAA doesn't prevent that, HIPAA says, you know, in the interest of care delivery, they have the right to do it, we're now kind of putting this uh, uh, this uh, consent component, uh, you know, on top of that because we have an electronic exchange. It's not, you know, I, I've seen it happen a lot of times as soon as you automate things and then right away things that happened in the manual world, uh, you know, kind of get you new visibility, new attention. But uh, uh, I, I do think that uh, they're going to have to know what's there. They also have to understand that the net result of this is that it, will be a better care delivery model. Uh, it's it's intended to improve the care coordination. They they understand, and I think most patients understand that that uh, they're not treated by one physician in, in their life. They they have a care team that has to take care of different things, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. So I think the fact that uh, we want to um, uh, kind of leverage this this care knowledge across many people, I think, is is another point of education uh, that they that they need to understand. Um, and and lastly, I'm going to come back to this patient identity thing. Uh, I think that the patient needs to be that control point. They have to make sure that their identification is consistent across the board with their providers. Um, and, you know, I've heard the pushback that says, well, sometimes patients intentionally, uh, you know, don't want to be identified as the same person. But, you know, I, I think that's going to come back. That's that going to be an exception, not, not the rule. But I think if the patient understands how important this is, that their identity, that their registration information needs to be consistent, and the fact that it will be available from one to the other will make that uh, that is uh, that a lot easier. Um, the, the, the main uh, message uh, in terms of what is going on, I, I think, is relatively simple, and, and it's that, that the industry is trying to move from a sickness model to a wellness model. And you know, that means that the patient, one, has to be more engaged because it's a matter of them being uh, well, not only showing up when they have a, when they have a cold or, or, or a disease or, or a procedure to be done, but they are participating in maintaining their health. And, uh, you know, I think if they think about that, I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of pushback with, uh, with them wanting to participate. Let me ask you a, a, a question about health literacy, John. I know that this isn't your area of expertise, but I know that you have direct experience in working on issues that uh, may uh, surround on the periphery the uh, the idea of health literacy. When when you open up health information vis-a-vis -vis electronic medical records or other electronic formats to patients so they have greater access to not only their own medical records but uh, more of a... Um, a uh, solid platform of communication with their provider or any other people within the network that are providing them care. Uh, I've been reading recently about um, health data literacy, and I guess what I'm what I'm what I wanted to ask you is: there's a difference between making information available to a patient uh, so that they can read through and understand more about uh, the, their own health condition and and perhaps some of others and how that may affect them. But what are 
or are hospitals and uh, medical facilities doing anything to help patients to understand the data? I know that it's being provided to them so that they can read it, but have you in your travels or conversations with other people seen any uh, educational pushes by healthcare facilities to help patients to understand more about what their medical records actually say and how to interpret the information? Yeah, John, I haven't, I haven't seen it at the institutional level per se, except in one regard of, of uh, patient portal and, and uh, you know, directing a patient to a good uh, web resource, uh, you know, for information. Um, but I, I do know of uh, some standards that are on the horizon that has to do with a uh, access to a knowledge base, a knowledge resource that uh, is intended to be focused on on patient level, uh, uh, you know, education and 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 literacy. Um, it's different than what's out there from the medical journals, as you correctly um, uh, indicated. It's it, it's it's intended to take this this medical jargon and interpret it. Um, into patient ease. Um, and uh, what we're going to see, I think, uh, in the not too distant future is, is systems that uh, maybe a personal health record system um, or even uh, systems that, uh, that might be, be available on the web and, and uh, with directed uh, um, entry points through the provider organizations. But I think we'll start to see, uh, you know, lexicons around medical terminology uh, that are able to bring it into something that that is more uh, readable and understandable by by patients. It's it's not going to happen uh, overnight, um, so we're going to see some iterative build on this. Um, but I I think it's a very important part of the idea of patient empowerment. Uh, we, we certainly have to look at the full uh, population mix that we are dealing with, and we have to understand that uh, we have to be able to uh, to accommodate and 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 get everybody up to the right level of liter literacy for their needs. That's a great point, John. Uh, one of the things that I've been reading about recently that goes along with, with uh, the, those, those great comments that you just made were was the fact that I, I, I believe that one of the theories behind moving towards an electronic medical record uh, format for healthcare was obviously to, to help everyone in the aggregate, but I know that oftentimes uh, you might find uh, maybe a lower income demographic or uh, the, those who uh, may not have access to uh, their electronic medical records vis-a-vis -vis the internet or other electronic means could benefit the most from seeing that type of information. So it'll be interesting to see how the healthcare industry approaches that and is able to possibly set up uh, maybe a public, you mentioned portals, uh, patient portals, uh, which are excellent sources of information for patients to read more about their own healthcare. But it'll be interesting to see how healthcare sort of um, uh, maybe tries to reach out to that uh, uh, that lower income demographic, or maybe those who who don't have uh, access to electronic uh, means to be able to see uh, their their electronic information, their electronic medical records. So, thanks for those comments. I know that wasn't uh, something we were uh, planning on talking about, but I do appreciate you chipping in um, uh, with that. And uh, let me let me kind of move on to another question. Um, and th th let me ask you, what what do you think some of the major challenges involved? with ensuring uh, data integrity and interoperability uh, as more hospitals acquire healthcare practices and clinics. So talking about mergers and acquisitions, what do you think some of the major challenges are as uh, more of these hospitals merge and, and partner together uh, when it comes to data integrity, data integrity and, and uh, interoperability? Well, initially, you know, I'd say, well, they have the same problem that they used to have, right? I mean, uh, you know, hospitals per se have typically had a pretty high level of automation, at least in this country. And, uh, you know, any time they would uh, be acquired or, or acquiring another system, there's a pretty heavy-duty assessment of the systems and, you know, how do you merge the data together and, and things like that. Um, uh, but, but now we, we see other kinds of acquisitions and, and partnering, and, and that has to do with ambulatory systems coming under the wing of acute care systems and IDNs being termed, et cetera. And as a result, 
you're now dealing with different flavors of how data is retained. And the only thing I can think is that we have to now try to leverage these interoperability standards as the linchpin. Um, if, if we can move the industry to uh, having standards way, a standard way of exchanging across all those boundaries, then the merger and acquisition uh, process uh, should be a little bit easier because they should be able to have a vehicle, uh, you know, to actually move a patient's information um, in, in, in a more efficient fashion. And, uh, and maybe they were already doing it because, uh, you know, this particular entity that they acquired uh, was one that was in their circle of friends or one that was of a, of a medical discipline that was, uh, you know, a collaborative effort. Uh, for best practice development or something. So I think as we start to see standards of interoperability be embraced, I think that the M&A thing would actually become uh, a little bit easier to accomplish from, from a technology or, or a data support side. We've been speaking with John Donnelly, the president of Interpro Solutions out of Colonia, New Jersey. Uh, and John is an expert in uh, healthcare data interoperability issues, especially uh, with the uh, new shift uh, for the healthcare industry towards electronic medical records. Uh, John, I want to thank you for your time today. I appreciate all of the feedback and insight that you gave us on the questions uh, that we had for you. And uh, we, we really just appreciate uh, you, you uh, spending some time with us today. John, my pleasure. Um... Uh, I think as we all become quite passionate in, in how do we make this transformation work for us all, um, I, I think it would be, uh, be a fun ride, but uh, one with some challenges as well.